The root locus technique was introduced in 1948 by Evans, and it is a graphical method to find a pulse with several function from the pulse of the loop gang. In control theory, they will to, to, uh, say this is a method to find the pulse of the closed loop gain from the open loop gain. But we don't use these words. We have servo function and loop gain. There are 10 construction rules. They're all in the book. Um, the proofs are not all given. For this, you need to go to control theory, but I will go along them today uh, and show you all the rules. So this is what I already told you, and we will do some examples here for a finite non, for systems with a finite non-zero DC loop gain. Of course, this is implemented in SlyCap because it's a very important tool that we will use for um, frequency compensation of uh, amplifiers. So let's see, we have the loop gain. Of, uh, and the loop gain according to the asymptotic uh, gain model. And we can write it in the case that we assume a finite non-zero DC gain as the product of this DC gain and a numerator polynomial and a denominator uh, divided by a denominator polynomial of the Laplace variable S. So DC loop gain, the numerator can be described with the zeros, the zeros of the loop gain, that's a polynomial you can describe with the solutions of the polynomial and the denominator with the poles of the loop gain. So then we know that the servo function can be written as the negative loop gain divided by one um, minus the loop gain. And if you substitute this expression with a DC loop gain and the numerator and the denominator as a function of S in it, you will get this expression. You can simplify it to this expression if you multiply both numerator and denominator of the several function with the denominator of the loop gain DS. So the poles of the several function, that is what we are interested in, in, interested in can be found from the solution of the denominator of s, the several function equals zero, which is ds minus ldc times ns equal zero. The root locus is a graphical method to find those solutions. It, let's say, if we change the dc loop gain ldc, then you can see, or at this moment, at least, I think you can assume that the solutions will change and that those solutions then, this uh, this poles that are tracing basically uh, paths in the complex plane. So these paths then depend on, of course, well, the three terms that you find in this expression, which is the poles of the loop gain, ds, say, set by ds, the zeros of the loop gain, set by the numerator polynomial, and of course, the dc loop gain. The starting point of the root locus is when the DC loop gain equals zero. If you substitute this in the equation, you find that DS equals zero, which means the starting point is at the poles of the loop gain. The end point is when the DC loop gain equals infinity. For this, you can divide this polynomial, this uh, the DS minus LDC NS by the DC loop gain. You will see that the endpoint then is the, the zeros of the loop gain. If there are no zeros, then we simply assume zeros at infinity, and somehow these poles will then, the solutions will then move towards infinity. And of course, for any value of the DC loop gain, you have the actual poles of the servo function for that value. So let's go to the rules. And I'm not going to prove all the rules, but I'm, made, I'm going to make them more or less acceptable for you to understand. The number of branches, so the number of traces that we get in the complex plane is, of course, equal to the number of poles because the traces, the paths, depend, uh, start on the poles, as we have seen before. Since in real systems, the uh, poles and are always complex conjugate or real, we have a symmetry with respect to the real axis. So always complex conjugated poles or real poles makes this happen. 
Well, this is basically what we already saw. The branches start at the poles of the loop gain. If we make the DC loop gain zero, then you see that the solution is DS equals zero, which means we are on the poles of the loop gain. And they end at zeros of the loop gain or at infinity. That is by letting LDC go to infinity. <clears throat> now, this is a, a rule that I, uh, let's say the proof of this rule you can find in the in the control theory books. I'm not going to prove these rules all on the sheet here, um, but I just want to mention them because then you can draw root Loki, and that's what we are going to do. So let's say the paths uh, parts of the real axis left from an odd number of poles and zeros belong to a branch of the root locus. I will give a illustration soon after I have. Uh, shown the rules. Well, if there are more poles and zeros, so the difference is then n minus n, uh, and those paths then tend to reach to infinity, that means there will be asymptotes. So there will be n minus m asymptotes, and the real axis intersection point of the asymptotes can be calculated as, and they always, the, many people call this a kind of center of gravity. You see, you give the poles a positive mass and the zero a negative mass, and you divide by, by their difference. And then you have the center uh, of gravity of poles and zeros. That is what they often refer to in this formula. The angles of the asymptotes are equally spaced. And the breakaway point and the rival points, but it, because they, the, the poles then can break away from the real axis at a different point where the asymptotes intersect. So the breakaway or arrival points can be calculated from the derivative of L equals zero that I'm also not going to prove. And also the breakaway angles are equally spaced. Now, maybe before, or before I will go to all kind of uh, um, examples that I have on the slides, maybe it's much more uh, helpful to do just something like on with a pen and a paper here on the screen. So let's say we have a system with one pole and one pole of the loop gain. So here we have the complex plane and we have one pole. What does the root locus method say? And this, of course, is a pole of the loop gain. So what will be the pole of the servo function? Well, if the loop gain, the DC loop gain equals zero, we start here. And if we then increase the DC loop gain, then the pole will move towards infinity. Okay, so that will be the root locus for a first order system. What does the rule tell us if we have two poles? If we have two poles, and let's give the loop gain in this case two negative real poles, one, two. Then it says that a part left from an odd number of poles and zeros, which is um, between the two poles, so which is here, belongs to the root locus. It says there will be uh, asymptotes and the number of asymptotes is equal to the number of poles minus the number of zeros, which is two asymptotes. And you can calculate the angles of the asymptotes from the formulas and you will find that one asymptote will go this way and one asymptote will go this way. So we have two asymptotes. And the poles, the breakaway point in this case will be equal to the uh, point where the asymptotes intersect. So the root locus of a second order system, only two poles will look like this. A next example, let's do an example with the zero. If we have a pole, and a zero, for example, in the loop gain, what will then be the root locus if we are going to um, increase the DC loop gain. So what will then happen is that the left from an odd number will belong to the root locus and the root locus starts on the pole and ends on the zero, which means that for increasing loop gain, this happens. 
and at the end, the pole stays on the zero. If you put them the other way around, so let's put them the other way around. We have here a pole and there is zero. Then the whole story is the same, which means the pole moves towards the zero and stays there uh, when the loop gain reaches infinity. That's a situation with <coughs> two poles and one zero. That is a situation that we will often do with if we are going to compensate amplifiers. So let's say we have here the complex plane. We have one pole here and one pole here. And let's put the zero there. So left from an odd number belongs to the root locus, which means that this part of the real axis belongs to the root locus. And this part completely up to infinity belongs to the root locus. There will be, um, so there will be one asymptote because the difference between the number of poles and zeros is one. And this asymptote is what I have already drawn you going to minus infinity. So there will be breakaway points and arrival points, and you can calculate them. And it turns out that you will have a circle Well, it's more a potato than a circle, but you know, it's intended to be a circle. And you can prove that the circle is around the zero. So the poles leave the real axis, arrive at the real axis again here, one moves towards the zero and one moves towards infinity. That is how the root locus for a second order system looks. This, by the way, is very nice. Let's see what, uh, what, you, what we can learn from this. Let's say we have here a second order system. Here you see a second order system. And that the poles are very complex. So we have a large loop gain and the, the real part is relatively small with respect to the imaginary part. If we, if we would then put a, if we are able to put a zero somewhere like, uh, like here, then we are going to bend this root locus to something around the zero. And that is what frequency compensation is about. We are going to use the zeros or we are going to manipulate the initial pole positions of the loop gain to make it happen that the endpoints of the root locus for the actual DC gain that we have in our amplifier is in positions where we want to have them. And preferably that will be maximally flat magnitude or better worth positions. <clears throat> 